Oh, it would appear. All right. Hope everybody had a good lunch. Uh, we now present Strom Carlson, who will be doing the talk talk. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope your lunch was good. This is the talk talk. I'm Strom Strom. And uh, so this presentation is basically a presentation about giving presentations. Many of you may want to give presentations. Many of you are probably giving, pre some of you are probably giving presentations here at Layer 1 or TourCon or DEF CON or wherever you choose to give presentations. And this talk is probably useful for you too if you, for, for example, have to give a presentation at work or just want to give one at your friend, to your friends at your user group meeting or for whatever reason, you want to give a technical presentation to somebody. So this talk is for all of you, not just those of you who have a pending presentation that you want to give, but perhaps those of you who also want to give a presentation but don't know how or are scared to. So anyone who technically proficient who wants to give talks to information security conventions, local meetings, wherever. So everyone from the complete nub all the way up to the experienced speaker and everyone in between. So all of you can benefit from this talk somehow. We're going to cover everything from thinking up the talk to actually giving the talk and afterwards. So planning the talk, preparing your talk, actually giving your talk, and what you do after the talk. So we're going to cover everything from the start to the finish. So let's start with planning. Actually, before we start with planning, let's do the introduction, which I have almost forgotten to do. How many of you have gone to a talk at a security convention like DEF CON, TourCon, Layer 1, and been bored out of your skulls? Right. How many of you have gone to a talk and been really interested in the topic and gotten lost five minutes in and not understood a word afterwards? Right. How many of you have gone to a talk that you really, really wanted to see and walked away really disappointed because you didn't learn a damn thing. So this talk hopefully will give you all the tools to not be that guy and to give the talk that people want to see and that people like and that they remain interested in and that they'll take something away from. So pay attention. First, you're going to plan your talk. Now, the first thing you're going to do before you do anything else is know who you're going to give your talk to. Know your audience. How many of you read Jerk City? One. Okay. So this is a Jerk City strip, which is a perfect example of not knowing your audience. Here we've got uh, Spigot and Deuce are the names of the characters. So this is a perfect example of not knowing your audience, which I think, I think some of you might be able to connect with. So Spigot says, let's go to the food court and get girls. We can talk to them about how my program doesn't compile. Perfect example of not knowing your audience, right? When was the last time you went to the food court and picked up girls and talked about how your program doesn't compile and actually got away with it? Never, right? You all need to relax. I'm not... Uh, you can talk. You can talk. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention. I've got a prize under the desk here, for, under, the le under the lectern, for a really, really good question. So if I hear a really good question from one of you, you will win something really cool. So keep that in mind. When you're giving a tech presentation, there are essentially three kinds of people that you're going to be giving presentations to. The grandmother, who represents the complete nub who knows nothing. The geek, who will lap up every technical detail you have to offer. And the business person, who really sort of knows a bit about technical details, but doesn't really care so much about the details. They want to know what's the point, right? So the grandmother is your archetype of the complete nub. She comes in, and she doesn't know a thing about computers. She doesn't even know how to turn a computer on. you know. And when you give your talk, even though you're giving a technical talk to a technical audience, many of the people, thank you so much, sir, many of the people who come to your talk will not know what you're talking about. Because when you give tech talks, 
what happens is you give tech talks on very specific, very detailed topic, topics. And most of the people who come in don't know about those topics. So for example, you give a tech talk on mobile phone hacking, on EVDO, for example, right? A lot of people, everyone in your audience probably has a mobile phone, but most of them probably don't know all the technical details of EVDO. So unless you actually take the time to teach people and introduce people, what is EVDO? Here's how it works. Here's the basics. They won't know. They're going to be lost immediately. So if you lose your audience five minutes in because you delve right into the technical detail, no good. There's also the geek. And as it turns out, if you need photos for your presentation, Flickr is a great, great place to go find them. Here is some guy licking his iPhone, new in box. I don't know why. I wish I understood that. But this is your archetypal geek, the person who, if you came up here and spent an hour reading out of the Nortel DMS-100 technical configuration manual, they would love you forever and want to marry you. You know? So this is the kind of person who's going to be hungry for technical detail. But, and they're going to, they're going to love you whatever you choose to do. But regardless, most of the time, you know, that person is actually few and far between. If you're giving a really, really interesting in-depth talk on a subject like hacking smart cards or hacking mobile phones or whatever, there are going to be a few people who come to your talk just for that talk. They've come to this presentation, they've come to the convention because that's the talk they really, really want to see and they really, really want to learn. And there's like going to be three of them in the talk, cons uh, and the rest of the people are going to be one of the other two types. So consider them as part of your audience, but don't make the classic mistake of believing that this person is the main member of your audience because he's not. He's a minority in your audience. The third type of person is what makes up the majority of your talk. The business person type. Now, I know most of you are not the you know arrogant executive in the tie who is 24 and thinks he owns the world. But the business person type does present a useful archetype where here's a person who has a grasp on technical things, but doesn't know all the details of what you're going to talk about, and wants to know the upshot. They don't really care whether or not the program loops with a for loop or a while loop or branches off or forks. They want to know, what can I do? What's the upshot? What does this actually mean to me? How does this impact me? So consider all these types when you're preparing your talk. Once you know your audience, and for tech audiences, for tech conventions, it's generally going to be the same type of audience every time. So don't worry too much about that. Once you know your audience, you're going to select a subject. Now, select a subject you know reasonably well or that you can research and know well. You don't want to give a talk on something you don't know anything about because you'll be laughed off the stage. You want to narrow your focus. You want to make sure that you can give a thorough coverage of your subject in only an hour or 45 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever, how much time you have allotted to you. You want to make the subject relevant to your audience. Knowing your audience helps you pick that. Definitely, there are audiences to whom you can give a talk, and they'll love it. You can give the same talk to a different audience, and they'll not have a clue what you're talking about. So definitely, you know, if you're giving a tech presentation, make it somewhat tech-related. I can give a presentation on how to give presentations to a whole bunch of different audiences. I'm focusing this one on how to give tech presentations, because most of you are technically inclined. Look how many laptops I see in this uh, if I were giving a presentation to the Pasadena Knitting Club, wouldn't make it about tech. Don't be afraid when you're doing your research and selecting your subject to start over. Yes, you may have a subject which is near and dear to your heart, but if you discover halfway through preparing your talk, it's not the subject you can talk about. If you discover that there is nothing that's doable, then don't be afraid to start over because better you should spend more time or spend you better you should throw out your existing talk and put together a talk which works well than spend all your time putting together a talk which doesn't actually work. So here's an example of a bad subject. Hacking smart cards. Why is this a bad subject? <laughs> because I gave that talk. This is not the talk I gave. Why is this a bad talk? Too broad, too general. Smart cards. Am I talking about Transit cards? Am I talking about FedEx cards? Am I talking about Visa cards? What am I talking about? 
Smart cards is a huge, huge subject. I mean, I'm sure Hikari here could talk for six hours on hacking smart cards and not even scratch the surface, right? Yes, <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> a better subject, security vulnerabilities in the FedEx Kinko stored value smart card. This is a focus presentation. It's a single implementation of a smart card. It's a single system. You can analyze it. And this is good because even though you may think, oh, but this is too focused. What do people want to know about Visa cards? What do people want to know about, you know, about Metro cards or Oyster cards or whatever? This is good because even though you're only, only analyzing one system, if you make your presentation such that the lessons learned in analyzing the faults of one system can be applied to any other system the user may encounter, then you've done your job and given a good presentation. You don't need to cover everything. You just need to cover one example that people can learn from. Of course, you also want to avoid topics which are completely irrelevant to your audience because nobody will care. No one wants to know how to make smart cards fashion accessories on MySpace or whatever, right? So once you've picked a topic, you start doing your research. You want to make sure you research your subject thoroughly before you begin writing your talk. Because unless you know all you need to know, you can't start actually putting together points which are relevant to your talk. If you only have a, a moderate grasp of your subject and you start writing your talk and then you do your research, you may miss something really big, which actually winds up being the key part of your talk. So make sure you do your research first and then start writing. Do not do the writing first and then research to match your writing. When you're researching, take copious, copious notes. Save copies of everything you come across. You can use it. You'll probably throw most of it out but make sure you document everything thoroughly. That way, if you do have something you want to use, you're not, you won't find yourself two months later writing your talk and saying, crap, that, that explanation I found of, of how this works, where was it again? And then you spend a day searching on Google or Yahoo trying to find it, and you can't find it. And then you're lost because you have nothing to back yourself up. So make sure you do all the documentation really thoroughly and make sure that you know your stuff. You can and will throw tons of stuff out, but it's better to have it all and throw it away than to not have it in the first place. And you're not going to really throw it all away. I'll show you why in a bit. Next, you want to select a thesis statement. Now, I'm just going to pause here quickly and note that for all of you who came in after the introduction of the talk, I have a prize to give away if you ask me a really, really good question that challenges me. So keep that in mind. You have a question? Because I want to get you guys paying attention. I want to get you guys thinking. I want you guys an active part of the audience. I don't want you guys to just sit there and absorb. I want you guys to sit there and think and question. I want you guys to be active participants, not just passive. So. Sorry? You said that means throw things. Throw things. So you want to select a thesis statement. Now, if any of you have written college papers or high school papers, this will seem very familiar to you. Thesis statement, a, th a single claim to argue during your talk. One thing to argue. Now, the reason it's important to select a thesis statement is because the thesis statement is what you're going to convince your audience of. It's all fine and well to tell the, your audience about something, but if you don't make it relevant and interesting, the audience has no reason to listen to. The audience needs a reason to pay attention to you. So the thesis statement is your argument to them. If you tell them, you going back to our Kinko's talk example, if you tell them, there's a vulnerability in Kinko's cards, well, that's good, but why should I care? If you tell them, Kinko's smart cards have a security vulnerability, and you can use this as an example of how not to set things up if you're setting up your own system or how to look for vulnerabilities in your own system, then they'll pay attention because they'll realize, oh, wait a second, I can use this information somehow even though I never, I never go to Kinko's. I can use this talk. This is relevant to me. This is a bit scary. So argue during your talk. Make your talk relevant and focused to your chosen subject. And you need to tell your audience again why they should care about what you have to say. So 
a bad thesis statement. FedEx Kinko stored value smart cards have a security vulnerability. Why is this a bad, why is this a bad thesis statement? Not so much too long, because the good one's actually longer. Yeah. So what about right. What about it? Why should, why should you care? This is the topic reworded. This is not a thesis statement. The topic is security vulnerabilities in FedEx can go to smart cards. There is no argument here. This is a truism. A good thesis statement would be something along the lines of, poor choices in the design phase of the FedEx Kinko stored value smart card system have led to pervasive, embarrassing insecurities. So now, this is more relevant. This is more hard-hitting. This is something you care about. Oh, look. Not only if I make poor, cho if I make poor choices in setting up my security system, not only will I have a lot to deal with, I'm going to be up the shitter. Because I'm going to be embarrassed. I may lose my job. I may lose my reputation. Maybe I should pay attention to this talk. So, yes. I don't know. <laughs> I wish I knew. Is it fixed yet? It's been modified. <laughs> I don't know if it's fixed per se. I haven't really looked at it since, but okay. Now that you have your topic and your thesis statement, now you can start to structure your talk. If you have ever written a paper in high school or college, this will seem eerily familiar. Introduction, three supporting arguments, and a conclusion. How many of you have done this before? See? This is not rocket science. Your introduction. First, you want to make friends with your audience. You want to be connected with your audience throughout the entire talk. How many of you have been to talks where the guy stands here at the lectern the entire time? and talks, and looks at the laptop, and talks, and looks at the laptop, gets the signal for 10 minutes left, doesn't acknowledge the guy for two minutes. You've been to that talk, right? That guy has not made friends with the audience. That guy is talking at an invisible brick wall right here. And there is a picture of the audience beyond it. But the guy has not made friends with the audience. He's not connected with you. You guys are not active participants, and he's not actively talking to you. He's giving his talk to the wall again. Make sure you introduce the subject to your audience. Make sure you want to tell them why they should care. You want to give them a good reason to keep listening to you. Again, if you lose your audience, you can't get them back. You might be able to, but as a general rule, expect that you can't. So make sure that your audience gets interested and stays interested the entire time you're giving your talk. Your supporting arguments are basically smaller, more focused versions of your primary argument. The best analogy for this I ever heard was in a debate class I took in high school, where basically your thesis and your overall point, think of it like a three-legged stool. The thesis and the overall point are the top part of the stool. Each of the supporting arguments is one of the legs. If one of those legs is weak, the whole thing collapses when you try and sit on it. So likewise, your talk needs three really strong supporting arguments, each hitting it from a different angle, which reinforce your primary point. You should have at least three, but no more than five supporting arguments. Why do you think this is? People forget things, right? I'm sorry? Exactly. If you have... No difficulty coming up with 10, 15, 20 supporting arguments. Your topic is too broad. You need to narrow it down. If you have a tough time coming up with even three, you've narrowed your topic too much. You need to expand it a little bit. So between three and five supporting arguments is a good number to aim for. Preferably three, possibly four, maybe five, depending on the length of your talk. Generally, you want to aim for three that you can talk about in depth rather than five you cover only so-so. But again, make sure, just think about your talk, think about your topic, and make sure that this makes sense for your talk. Finally, your conclusion. You wrap up the talk, you review your primary arguments, and you make a connection back to your introduction. The conclusion is where you tell your audience what they're going to remember. The audience is going to be entertained, but let's face it. You sit in this talk for an hour, I talk for an hour, 
you're not going to remember everything I say. That's what the video is for. So you can go back and re review it later, right? The conclusion is well, you, where you tell people, this is what you're going to remember. These are the five things I want you to remember as you walk out that door. And if you can get your audience to remember those five things and remember how you expanded on them in your talk, you've done your job. So now, preparing the talk. The one big overall overarching thing to remember when preparing the talk is the KISS principle, which some of you may be familiar with, some of you may not be familiar with. It has nothing to do with kissing, it has nothing to do with lips, it has nothing to do with makeup. It is, keep it simple, stupid. Because when you have done all your research and you've found everything you need to find and you're ready to write your talk, you're going to have a massive pile of information. And many people, based on talks I've gone to, think that what you do next is you take this massive pile of information, you put it into PowerPoint, and then you talk about it. Or you go up and you read the PowerPoint and get all the stuff into the audience verbally as quickly as you can in the hour you've got. Right? No. It's a question of time. 30 to 50 minutes is not a lot of time to give a talk. If you've never given a talk before, you're going to think, an hour? How am I ever going to talk for an hour about the subject? Oh my god, I better find as much information as I can so that I can just talk and talk and talk, not have to pause. But that's not it. An hour is not a lot of time. I mean, it's already been 20 minutes that I've been giving this talk. And we haven't covered a whole lot of information yet. So it's not a lot of time. You're going to discard as much information as you can. How many of you have seen L.A. Story? Okay, remember that scene in the beginning where Steve Martin's girlfriend does this and then pulls off the first thing that catches her eye? No. Okay, clearly all of you need to watch that movie. It's a great, stupid movie. You're going to discard as much information as possible. I forget who said this, but perfection is achieved not when there is nothing to add, but when there is nothing to take away. You're going to prune as much and make this as simple and easy to understand as possible. Of course, make sure when you're putting your talk together, you save at least five minutes at the end for a Q&A session because your audience is going to have questions. We're going to cover this in a bit, so keep that in mind. But remember, save some time at the end for the audience to ask you questions. And now, my biggest pet peeve with so many tech talks, the PowerPoint problem. PowerPoint is not your talk. PowerPoint is merely there to assist you in your talk. You are the speaker. If all you're doing is taking all your research, putting it in PowerPoint, and reading it to the audience, your function is completely irrelevant as a speaker. The audience could literally take your documents and just read them at home. Why should they come to your talk if all you're going to do is read to them? You need to convince your audience of something. You need to argue. Don't just have tons of information for your audience. The solution to the PowerPoint problem, keep your slides basic, simple summaries of what you intend to say. Note that most of what I'm saying is not actually on the slide. How many talks have you gone to where every sentence the person says shows up on the screen? Raise your hand if you've been to that talk. Yes, uh -huh, the eye chart. Or as someone said, the wall of text problem. You know? Make your diagrams clear and easy to understand quickly. And make sure that you provide any detailed information in a supplementary document. If you've got tons of research and the research and the data is important to the people who care, you will put that information in a report, in a set of documents, and distribute it to people on the conference CD, on the conference website, or on your own website. If you want more of the detailed information, go to my website and read the information on your own time. But don't waste most of your audience's time telling them the technical details of every little thing you talk about. Now, the, the reason you want to keep your slides as simple as possible, why do you think? What do you think the reason for that is? It's distracting. When a, when a slide shows up with a ton of text, what happens? Everyone looks at the slide and stops listening to you until they finish reading the slide. So 
when you pull up your slide with the wall of text, whatever you say for the next 30 seconds has gone on deaf ears. No one listens to it. So let's look at some bad slides, right? And the sad part about this, this bad slides thing is I have to look no further than the DEF CON CDs I have lying around at home. So this is one such bad slide. Someone presented this at DEF CON. Too much information. Sorry? TMI. Yes, exactly. TMI. <laughs> Both, right? It's too much information and it's a disaster. So, I mean, if this came up, you would be all reading this and you wouldn't pay attention to me. Can any of you in the back actually read the slide at all? You can read that? You can kind of read that. Okay. You can't understand it. What's the point, right? This is... This is assembly language, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So this is too much information, guys. Even I've been guilty of this. If you saw my Kinko's talk, this is my slide from the Kinko's talk. And uh, yeah, way too much data. I'm sure you that cannot read this one. Sorry? Yes. 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 Mm-hmm. Even some people who are very well regarded as, as good speakers have fallen victim to the wall of text problem. And I keep liking to say, I, I like to say that this is the, the next slide is going to ruin my DEF CON speaking career. But um, yeah. Yeah, this is not only the wall of text. This is the every sentence I say shows up on the slide. Slide. This is a fun one. Way too much data, and you can't read it. I can barely read this one over here. Here's another one. What the hell is this? Yeah. Can any of you figure out what this is supposed to be at all? Terrible, terrible slide. And I've saved the worst for last. Yeah. <laughs> Blink tag. Sorry? What is this? <laughs> of course. Right. Yeah. Don't put TCP dump on your slide, people. Seriously. All right. So now. The other pitfall, apart from the wall of text, terrible slide, who can guess what the next pitfall is? Sorry? The live demo. <laughs> oh boy, the live demo. How many of you have sat through five minutes of, oh, let me just get my live demo working? I should see more hands. Come on. You've been there. There we go. <laughs> Live demos, as a rule, can and will go horribly, painfully, terribly wrong. They won't work when you want them to. If you do a live demo, it must be short. I have seen so many live demos where it's 20 minutes of someone typing text into a terminal, and I get bored, and I don't care anymore at the end. Live demo must be short, must be to the point, must progress quickly, and only effective if done extremely well. Otherwise, you're better off doing like a slideshow of what you intend. That way you can skip over all the boring parts, skip over all the let's wait here for five minutes while it figures out the security key parts and get to the point and get on with your talk. Because again, you don't have a lot of time. A recorded demo, perhaps if you can tighten it up, if you can cut it down, or just do a slideshow. Sorry? Have Well, no, don't even do a live demo unless you can do it right on the spot, have it be a couple minutes long, and that's it. The best live demo I saw was the live demo uh, last year that, um, that Zach gave for his, uh, for his proximity card demonstration. If you look at the video of that one, he's got it all set up, and he just does his thing, and it beeps, and he's on to the next point. He does his card, and it beeps, and he's on to the next point. There is no, nothing that breaks, nothing that fails, not the datagram talk. <laughs> uh, I love you, Datagram. 
<laughs> this was a fun moment. I remember this one. So do a slideshow. For example, if you're going to introduce a new protocol, let's have our characters from Jerk City introduce the protocol. Hi, Cox. The High Cox Protocol, RFC 4373. Do any of you know what RFC 4370 is, 4373 is? LDAP. So, yeah. And also, you want to make sure you proofread your slides. Right? How many of you have been to presentations and seen horrendously bad spelling errors, typos, grammar problems on the slides? Does that not make the, uh, the presenter look a bit stupid in your eyes? Reduces their credibility. Unless English isn't their first Perhaps. But still, there are things called spell checkers. There are friends who speak the language. You want to make sure you proofread your slides to avoid making yourself look dumb. If your English is your second language, you have somewhat of an excuse. I've seen people who's, who have English, I have friends who speak English as a second language who speak English far better than many people I know who for, for whom English is their primary language. So. That's not maybe maybe not the best excuse. Check your spelling and grammar. Check your spelling and grammar. Check your spelling and grammar. So there are spell checks in my instant messaging client, for God's sake. You can check your spelling and grammar. Check for consistency. Note how almost slides are the same. They're all consistent. Makes it look polished. Makes it look good. Makes it look good. Makes it look like you put time and effort into your presentation and didn't just put it together the morning before. Have someone else read through your slides and give you feedback. This is important. Have someone you trust give you feedback and tell them to be ruthless. If they tell you this makes no sense, I don't understand this, this is boring, listen to them. Because if they're telling you these things, most people who come to your talk are going to tell you the same thing. And then, really important, ignore your slides for a few days, then come back and proofread them again. This is going to do wonders for your talk because you're going to come back after a weekend or after a couple days of surfing or skiing or whatever you choose to do, and you're going to go, what the hell was I thinking? If all you do is live in your slides from the moment you start until the moment you talk, you're going to lose track of reality. You're going to lose track of how it looks as someone who is not intimately familiar with what you're going through to prepare your talk. So make sure you give yourself some time between putting your talk together and looking at it again to give yourself a fresh dose of perspective. And be ruthless. Take things out. Change things. Don't be afraid to do this. The better you can make it, the more people you can show it to beforehand and have them say, yeah, this is a great talk, or this makes no sense, the better you're going to do when you give it to a real audience of people you don't know. So now, giving the talk. Our third point. You want to consider your audience. The audience is very eager to hear what you have to say. If they didn't want to hear what you have to say, they wouldn't be spending hours of their time sitting in a, in a room listening to you talk. They would be off at home, reading things on the web, playing games, doing whatever they do at home. Make the audience work for you by giving them what they want. So, what does the audience want? Prizes, yes. <laughs> the audience wants to know new things and what they want to have a good time learning them. That's all they want. They don't need to know everything in the tech manual. They don't need to know all the trials and tribulations of how you got from point A to point B. They want to know what is this and how does it affect me. And that's it. And have a good time learning it. So when you speak, Make sure, first off, slow down. Make a when you practice your talk, make a recording of yourself giving the talk. And then listen to the recording. You will be horrified at what you sound like. You speak way too fast. You mumble. You skip over important details. Make sure you slow down when you give your talk so that people can understand you. How many of you have been to the talk? I think I talked really fast. I've been talking about microphone. Hands? Come on. If you've been to DEF CON, you've been to that talk. Enunciate. Make sure you're pronouncing things. Again, 
Just because you're talking doesn't mean the audience can understand you. And going back to that English as a second language thing, many members of your audience may not speak English natively. They may not know what <laughs> means. Make sure you make an effort to make yourself clear to your audience. Otherwise, they're going to get tired of trying to understand you, and they're going to give up and go surf the web on their laptops. Datagram and standard error. <laughs> and finally, relax. When do you want to go to it? Relax when you give your talk. You may be terrified to make a mistake. If you make a mistake, is your audience really going to know? How many of you have been to a talk and gone, Oh, you made a mistake! One person in the back. Two people. Right? Okay, come on, guys. But seriously, most people in the audience aren't going to care if you miss a point, if you stumble, if you forget something and say, you know what, I forgot to mention this two points ago, but this bears repeating. Relax. Put yourself in the audience's shoes. You've been to talks. You've seen talks. You know what it's like to be the audience member. Don't put yourself in front of a sea of people who are hypercritical because they're not. Here's the point, which I'm sure our video guy hates me for. Get away from the lectern. Don't spend your entire talk stuck in one place, because seriously, that's boring, really. Get yourself a little wireless remote so you can advance slides without being in front of your laptop. And also, the other th reason to get away from the lectern, it forces you to not rely on your PowerPoint slides as a crutch. Your PowerPoint slides are not your show notes. There is a thing at the bottom on my screen. I've got the slide. I've got a window below that says click to add notes. I can type notes to myself. I've got no notes. All I need to know is in the summary on the slides. So make sure that you get away from that. Connect with your audience. The other thing is, I'm standing here. There is more of me for you to look at. If I'm standing here, I'm hiding behind the lectern. And there's a barrier between you and me. And I'm not connecting with you guys. If I'm over here, I'm more connected with you guys. It's friendlier. It's more casual. You guys are more interested. You're paying more attention. So get yourself one of these little remotes. And get away from the lectern. Now, on the subject of humor, humor is necessary. You're giving a technical talk. You don't want to bore your audience. You want to make them have a good time. Be funny. Be relaxed. If you get your audience laughing, that relaxes them. And that makes them more apt to pay attention. It's more like, hey, we're two friends. We're having a chat. Rather than, I'm the professor. You are the student. You'll be quiet. However, unfunny jokes will make your audience disinterested in everything you have to say. Because now they're no longer interested in what you have to say. They're thinking, oh god, this guy is trying to be funny and failing miserably. I don't want to listen to him anymore. So bounce your jokes off people. Also, don't do the humor too much. You're giving a tech presentation. You're not a stand-up comedian. Too much humor is a bad, bad thing. So try not to do that. As a last resort, ask your friends, does this joke sound funny to you? Would I use this? But when you're peering out all the excess humor you put into your talk, use the same rule as when you're peering out technical information. Keep it simple. Keep it basic. Just throw in a joke every now and again where it makes sense and where it's relevant to your audience. Pay attention also. You want your audience to pay attention to you, so you should pay attention to your audience. Going back to our example of the guy who stands behind the lectern and reads the PowerPoint slides and tells you everything on the slide and doesn't pay attention to the guy standing here for five minutes saying, you have 10 minutes left. Hello, sir. Sir. Hello. Hello. The guy's in his own little bubble, not paying attention to you as the audience. So if the presenter doesn't care about you, why should you as the audience care about the presenter? Your audience will tell you whether they're having a good time or a bad time. If they're interested in you, they'll be looking at you. They'll be interested. They'll be studying your slides. They'll look back and forth. You'll see that look of, I'm thinking. This makes sense. This is cool. I'm interested. If you've lost them, you're going to see, or you're going to see, 
faces buried in laptops. Or you're going to see people chatting back and forth. Or you're going to see doodling. They're not going to be looking at you or the slide. They're going to be bored, and you're going to be able to tell by looking directly at them. So you must respond to your audience. If you're losing your audience, do something to get them back. Get their attention. Have fun. Tell them, what do you ask them? What do you want to know? What can I do for you to make you have a good time? Ask them to tell you something. Ask them to participate. Ask them to be part of the, part of the presentation and not just listeners to a TV set which happens to be live in front of them. So now, after you give the talk, the Q&A session is where you go from being the speaker to being the expert. Any idiot can, give up and can come up here and give a talk about anything. However, the Q&A is where you really shine because if you've done all your research properly, all that research will be buried in the back of your head somewhere, even though you've torn most of it out of your presentation. So all the research will be in the back of your head and it'll be on that CD you gave to everybody. And when people ask you questions, you can go, oh yeah, that weird thing you're asking about, well really what happens is this, 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 and this. That's your chance to shine. That's where the audience believes you. That's where they go from, here's someone who says something interesting to here's someone I want to talk to. Here's someone I want to get to know. Here's someone I'd like to talk to because I respect their knowledge about the subject. Always give your audience time to ask you questions. And one of my biggest, biggest pet peeves in tech talks, when someone asks you a question, repeat the question before you answer it. Because if this guy up here asks a question, and I can hear him fine, and I start answering the question, you in the back haven't heard the question, and therefore my answer makes no sense, and therefore you're not going to pay attention to it. So when someone asks you a question, repeat the question, because not only will it make sure that you understand the question properly before you answer it, it'll make sure that everyone else knows what the question is, and therefore what the answer actually relates to. Otherwise, you're giving them information they're going to throw away and never use, and you're wasting your time and their time, and the only person whose time you're giving is the person who asked the question, and maybe whoever was in earshot. And that's a bad, bad thing. You don't want to waste anyone's time, not yours, not the audience's. When your time is up, invite people to talk to you one-on-one -on -one outside the presentation. There's only so much time for Q&A anyway, so really let people talk to you afterwards. It's only a good thing. So, just to summarize, and again, what do we do in the summary and the conclusion? Go back to the beginning and? Thesis. Thesis and? What am I going to tell you now? What you're to remember when you walk out the door, right? So, know your audience and prepare the talk which they will find useful and interesting. Two key things, useful and interesting, knowledge and entertainment. Teach both the tech savvy and those who are unfamiliar with, the with your subject matter. Again, if you do not properly introduce your subject matter, if you don't teach your audience, this is the first thing I'm going to talk about, and this is why it's important. This is the second thing which I'm going to talk about. This is why it's important. And finally, this is how it all relates. If you just dive straight into the technical detail, you've lost 80% of your audience, and you're never going to get them back. So teach them. Don't just instruct them. Teach them. Tell them. Help them learn. They came to your talk to learn, not just to hear what they can read online. Throw away everything you possibly can. I went through the slideshow last night and said, what can I throw away? Even though I've given this talk before several times, I went through and I said, what can I delete? What doesn't make sense? What's irrelevant? What can I throw out? I threw out like three or four slides. Keep it simple. Your slideshow is not your talk. Your slideshow is not your show notes. Your slideshow is a summary of what you're talking about. Your slideshow is a guide. So that if your audience does happen to space out for five seconds, they can look at it and go, oh, that's what he's talking about, and come back to you. If you do the wall of text, you're distracting your audience. Do not use your PowerPoint slideshow as a crutch. Do not use the lectern as a crutch. Because, again, if that's the case, you're wasting everyone's time and your audience will be better served by just reading what you have to say online, at home, in their underwear. Avoid the live demo if you possibly can. Make it a slideshow or make it a video or something. Cut it down and make it not a major part of your presentation. Slow down and relax so people can understand you. And finally, 
Give the audience time to ask you questions. With that in mind, do you all have any questions? Yes. For an observation and a question, things you've done well. Sensory font 24 point high contrast for your PowerPoint. That's key. Yes. Make the power. Uh, one thing he's pointing out the PowerPoint slides are really legible. Make them legible to everybody in the back with eye problems. Make the typeface big. Make it simple. Make it, you know, easy to read. Maybe they came in late. <laughs> yes, hostile audience. Yes. Was there more you wanted to point out? Hello, blah, blah, blah. If you hold the mic in front of your mouth, he can't get that syllable up. Peter Piper pecked a pa 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 pa. If you do it here, pa 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 pa, you don't get that noise in the microphone. And you never heard him say, you know, or um, or yeah. Yes, avoid filler words. Do not say like, um, yeah, you know, uh, right, also, and all. And all. Yeah, avoid that stuff. If you need to take a second to think, don't say anything. Just take that second to think. Now, you had a question in the back, sir? I actually want the question was, I didn't hear <laughs> <laughs> The question was, I didn't hear him. So, the, I'm sorry. See, I didn't quite follow my own advice. What he said was, why would they be sitting in the back if they're wearing eyeglasses and have eye problems? But... Like I said, perhaps the talk was full. How forgiving is LA 2600 on using them for practice for DEF CON? How forgiving is LA 2600 on using them for practice for DEF CON? We're damn forgiving. I gave this talk to them. I've given DEF CON talks to them before. Not true. We hit strong. I want to see your asterisk talk. This is a live demo. And yeah. Well, I've given talks which violate all these rules. Yeah. But that's before I really figured things out. You had a question, Julio. All right, the question is, people have, t have problems giving talks because they're afraid. How can you relax? Well, first off, be comfortable with people in general. Spend time with people. Hang out with people. You know, go to your meetings, meet people. Meet people, yes. And also, as Stan is helpfully pointing out, beer. Beer is a very useful thing. Beer or alcohol or whatever you want to use to, uh, to relax. Yes, question. Yes, the point, again, for those of you who can't hear it, practice your material, know your material well. This is why I advise you to pick a subject you know well already. That way, when you give the subject, when you give the talk, you know what you're talking about. Again, if you know ahead of time what your basic out outline is and what you're going to talk about, you shouldn't need to rely on PowerPoint as a crutch. You know your way through the, t through the talk. So... Yeah, yeah. Like like Datagram says, even if you're not done, give your talk to your friends, ask them for advice. It's very useful. Uh, okay, I have time for I think one more question. And if you have any more questions, please come see me afterwards.
If you okay, bar, the, the, that's a good question. Is there a barometer for do you know a subject well enough to talk about it? Sometimes no, but sometimes yes. Can you find your you know, find someone who you know, a good friend of yours, and say, hey, I want to teach you about subject. Okay, tell me everything I need to know. If you can sit there for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and teach them the basics, and teach them everything they need to understand, maybe they won't understand it, but if you can sit there and teach it to them for an hour or so, you've probably got a good enough grasp on it. If you're struggling to come up with material after 20 minutes, probably not. But again, the thing about knowing the subject well is see if you can come up with just a basic outline without having any research done. Can you think of a good thesis statement? Can you think of three strong points? Because again, if you think about an hour, right, your introduction is maybe five minutes, your conclusion is 10 minutes, your Q&A is another 10, 15 minutes, so that's already, what, 30 minutes? So each of your three points is 10 minutes long. Can you talk for 10 minutes about each of your three points? then you're probably good to go. All right. So as far as the really good question, who has the really, really good question? OK. <laughs> go ahead. Additional advice. Right. Yeah, it's a soft topic, which is more an advice topic than anything else. That's a good question because I didn't cover it. So, all right. So. What do you do with a heckler? Well, the first thing is to not let the heckler get to you. Relax. Chill out. You can laugh it off and move on. If the audience respects you, they're going to shut up when you move on to the next point. If you've done your job, if the audience respects you, they're going to shut up, and they're all going to ignore the heckler and say, OK, that was funny. Let's get on to paying more attention to him. So make your talk strong. Know your stuff. And But the really thing is just, you know, be social with people beforehand. Know how to, how to handle them. Know how to just laugh it off. Don't let it get to you. It's not a problem. So since I think you asked actually two really good questions, you're going to win the prize, which It's 30 years old, take care of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I pulled it out of my basement. I'm like, it deserves a good home rather than being collecting dust in my basement. So. Sweet. Sweet. All right. If you all have any more questions, feel free to, uh, feel free to hit me up anytime during the con or uh, stromcarlson.com. There's my contact information on the front of the page if you want get, to get me out to the convention. So thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience.